Welcome back to the implementation track. This is day two on Eyes on Dry Eye 2022. I am your host for this track and co-host for this event, uh, Dr. Damon Durker. I am Director of Optometric Services at Eye Surgeons of Indiana. Part of what we're doing on this implementation track is really a tell it like it is, it's a non-CE track. So our audience and our panelists are going to be able to interact to really get some pearls that they can take home to their practice uh, and next week really dive into helping patients have better outcomes and having better success with your dry eye practice. This is our second surgical talk. Uh, we had a great session last night with Dr. Blake Williamson and Dr. Josh Davidson on implementing a dry eye disease protocol in a surgical practice. Now this is actually how to improve your outcomes in cataract surgery, refractive surgery, how to do that in dry eye disease patients. So I'm very excited to uh, introduce our panelists, Dr. Melissa Bollinger and Dr. Mitch Jackson. Dr. Bollinger, Dr. Jackson, welcome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your practice? Thank you, Damon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mitch and I are really excited to be here. I, I've been a huge fan of this program for years. I've been watching it ever since it started. I'm uh, really happy to be a part of it. Uh, so Mitch and I practice together in a tertiary care center in the Chicagoland area. Uh, so we see anything anterior seg, and certainly there is not a day that goes by that we don't see patients who are interested in having cataract surgery. Um, so uh, we're really excited today to you know, talk about this topic, a topic we know a lot about. Um, I think all of us as eye doctors are very aware nowadays of how much uh, ocular surface disease has an effect on surgical outcome. And I, I really believe one of the number one reasons uh, patients have trouble postoperatively or uh, dissatisfied with the result is, is due to ocular surface disease that was not caught, treated, and managed. Yeah, so we, um, thanks for having us, Dave. This is great. This will be a great conversation today. I'm very lucky to have Dr. Bollinger in my practice. She uh, allows all my great surgeries to have great outcomes because she's doing a great job managing all these tries we're going to talk about today. Um, Jackson and I, we're in, uh, starting our 30th year in practice. And we're covering everything and your segment, and we get a really lot of complex cases, and we're excited to share a couple of really cool cases. So. Great. And reminder here is I'm going to be acting really as the moderator for this session. I'm going to be looking at the chat and looking for questions for Melissa and Mitch, and we will interject throughout. We'll also have some dedicated Q&A time at the end of the uh, couple of cases that they're going to present. So um, why don't we get right into it? Melissa, tell us about the FACO study results and what that means for a refractive practice. One of the things that came out yesterday in Blake's uh, session along with Josh was that you really can't have a premium cataract refractive practice without having a premium full service dry eye clinic within that practice. Is that something that you guys agree with? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and this study, yeah, and this study I think was really co a cool way to show it. It was done in 2017, so it was a multi-center study uh, is led by Bill Trattler. So what they were looking at was, um, you know, looking at centers like ours, patients coming in who are interested in cataract surgery, and, and they were looking for the incidence of patients uh, in that cataract group who had also had dry eye. Uh, so what they did, they looked at four things. Uh, they did a questionnaire, which was OSDI, just to get the patient input. They did corneal staining, conjunctival staining, and tear breakup time. And uh, the results, I think, were probably shocking even to those who were involved in it. So 77% uh, of the patients uh, that were coming in for a surgical consult had corneal staining. And amazingly, about 50% of those were central staining. So we all know how much of that would be affecting the, the quality of their vision and certainly uh, your uh, K measurements. Um, and then 63% of them had a tear break of time of five seconds or less. And um, only 20% of these patients uh, had an established diagnosis of dry eye. Um, and, and that certainly reflects very much what we see in, in our center, you know, and, and it is hard, you know, when you're uh, a, 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 an optometrist referring a patient over to a cataract center, you know, the patient's not complaining, you know, if you're not really looking for it, it's, it's, it's really easy to miss it. Yeah, the, the, great, the crazy thing about this study and a follow-up, a Duke study did a follow-up showing the similar results of most of our patients come in asymptomatic, and but majority have signs of dry disease. And so 
If we don't catch it early and treat it, it's really going to affect our outcomes. So these studies are powerful and we have to always educate our patients so they know ahead of time that the surgery didn't cause the dry eye. They already had it before surgery. So tell us a little bit about how you catch these patients. What is the specific protocol that you use at Jackson Eye? What technology are you using? Does this happen on a separate visit from the cataract or refractive consult? How does this work with Melissa and Mitch in terms of who's doing what? So, you know, we have a great team of technicians. Uh, you know, we're constantly updating them on our thoughts on this. And anyone who comes in for any surgical eval, uh, we are looking for dry eye. You know, it, it's such a, a big factor in the outcome. It'd be so terrible to put a premium lens in, do everything right with the measurements and a, and a patient with healthy eyes and, you know, let something like ocular surface disease affect the uh, patient happiness with the result. So the first thing we do, they all get a uh, modified version of the OSDI questionnaire. And, you know, as we all know, sometimes those, those will be surprising, a patient that's not saying a word about dry eye and they'll come up with a, you know, high score. Um, they all get osmolarity testing. Um, they all get meibomian gland imaging, which I think is a really valuable resource, you know, that you can, you know, quickly explain to the patient, you know, what you're even talking about. No one understands meibomian glands, you know, if you're not really, uh, don't have, a picture's worth a thousand words, you need something to show it to them. And it, to me, it's uh, probably the easiest way to get a patient to understand is show them that image. Um, and then when we come in, so the technicians have done all of that. And then when we come in, we're going to stain the patients, uh, primarily fluorescein staining, looking for tear breakup time, SBK, uh, certainly analyze the lids. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always amazed at how many patients, if you just have them close their eyes, how many of them have lag ophthalmos and don't even know it and how that's you know gonna, going to affect their outcome. Um, and then the key piece is, you know, once you see all this is being able to effectively explain to the patient, like, you know, I'll, typically I'll say to the patient, you know, you, you're here for cataract surgery, the cataract is blurring your vision, um, but you also have this dry eye piece, which is a factor in, in the quality of your vision. So, you know, I'm going to send you to Dr. Jackson, he's going to take your cataract out, that's going to be cured, but this dry eye piece is, is going to affect the quality of your vision. So we have to address both, uh, we have to treat it on the front end, and because it is a chronic condition, we'll have to manage it on the back end as well to get you a good, consistent uh, image. The biggest, the biggest change is objective data. It's so hard to tell patients like, oh, your tear breakup time is three seconds. They have no idea what you're talking about. They have nothing to look at. So we have devices that image and you can show a picture to a patient, but the myeloming gland imaging, when you show them, they have like little to no glands. A tear osmolarity, where you give them a number, Kind of no different than like an A1C for a diabetic. They they can understand better. You can really show what it means, and they'll be more compliant in trying to help themselves to get better based on our treatment plans that we recommend. So I'm going to ask our audience to chime in in the chat. You know, what are you doing that's the same or different in your practice for a, a pre-op dry eye protocol? Are you screening everybody with the questionnaire? Are you doing vital dye? point of care diagnostics with osmolarity, MMP9? Are you doing imaging? How does that look in your practice just to get that conversation started? I have a question for Melissa here is, let's say that someone comes in and, and they've been told they have a cataract and they have really mostly cataract complaints and not a fluctuating vision or eye fatigue or burning and their OSDI is basically zero. Let's say it's a six on the OSDI. Do they still get osmolarity? Do they still get imaging and staining? And if, if so, tell us how that works logistically. Yeah, without a doubt, um, because, um, you know, there, studies are showing like 50% of patients don't even show corneal staining, uh, probably the most common thing, you know, eye doctors are looking for. Um, osmolarity sometimes will be shocking. You know, hyperosmolarity leads to, you know, tear insufficiency. Uh, there's definite studies that show osmolarity alone can, uh, a high osmo osmolarity can really affect uh, your measurements, the consistency of your measurements, and ultimately the outcome. Good. Our, um, the good thing is we have a couple of really cool cases. You're going to see two extreme examples where the data is obvious they're dry and the data is not so obvious they're dry, but it can affect outcomes either way. And just so you all know, we're lucky we have all these devices and things in our practice, but you may, you can still diagnose dry eye preoperatively just with one thing. 
you don't have to have all these devices. You can look at the slit lamp, keratometry, Myers. There's so many different ways staining just to, to pick up even the, the hint of dry eye ahead of time and start the treatment plan before referring to us. So let's jump into those cases, but I, I know we alluded to this study, Melissa, earlier, but tell us a little bit more about the Epitropolis study and osmolarity in terms of how you relate this to your practice. Sure, so Alice Epitropoulos is a great cataract surgeon in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And so what she did is she looked at a group of patients coming into her office who were looking to have cataract surgery and she classified them um, into hyperosmolar uh, candidates with osmolarity testing and people who had normal. Uh, so it was a fairly small group. It was about 75 patients. Uh, 50 of them were in the hyperosmolar category, which she classified as uh, osmolarity of greater than 316 uh, in at least one eye. And then she had about 25 patients who were normal osmolarity. So they were uh, 308 or less, uh, you know, what we would expect to be uh, normal. And so what she did is she did uh, IOL master testing and looked, you know, did her keratometry readings, um, looking for the, the magnitude of the astigmatism, um, the uh, average K, uh, looking for her, you know, lens calculations. And then three weeks later, she had these patients come back and she repeated uh, the IOL master and looked at the same parameters. So when, when you look at the, the graph here, the blue is the, the normal category and the, I guess, gold there is more the hyperosmolar uh, group. And so without a doubt, there was a lot more variability between her you know, baseline readings and her three week with the hyperosmolar group than there was with the uh, normal. And some of them is pretty shocking, you know, three diopters off. I mean, it's, you know, so just that parameter alone, you know, could have really created a train wreck in the cataract result. Yeah, this, this is a great study. Um, it's, the, it's objective. And if you're doing, even if you're just doing standard cataract surgery, never mind premium upgraded IOLs, you don't want to be three diopters off, period. And that's kind of, you know, that's not why people come in to get cataract surgery. So this was a really critical study showing tear film homeostasis is critical for getting really good outcomes. And you'll see it, you'll repeat IOL master readings or whatever device you use and you start the treatment, you'll see them back in two, three weeks, you'll be surprised how much everything's looking better. You'd be off by like two to three diopters on an IOL, it's amazing. So let's get into the cases. I know we've got two cases and there's a lot to dig into. <laughs> Why don't we lead off with a patient one, which is an existing patient in your practice. Yeah, so this lady it would be the one you classify as your train wreck patient. Uh, so we've been seeing this patient for a long time. Uh, she's your classic postmenopausal female. She has rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension. Um, so we've been monitoring her cataracts as well. So she comes in, she's you know finally decided the cataracts are, according to her, affecting her vision enough that she wants to get it taken care of. So she meets all the you know, medical necessity requirements, everything makes sense. So we start, we've been trying to treat her dry eye for years, but she, you know, she's a typical patient that, you know, she has the flares, you know, she has an autoimmune disease. She's very classic. She'll come in, you know, countless emergency, you know, visits over the years. And it's, it's always her dry eye, you know, but she thinks, oh, she, it's something else. It, it, it never seems to like click with her. Um, so at the time she's in a crisis, she'll listen to you you know, we've had her on immunomodulators, we have her on uh, steroids, Isuvis has been a great product for her, and artificial tears, but, you know, she only treats it when she's in, you know, crisis mode, you know, the, like many of us deal with. Um, so now she wants to have cataract surgery. So then, you know, I had a really frank discussion with her, like, and because of course she doesn't want to wear glasses afterwards either. So just, uh, just what you would expect. So your nightmare patient wants the premium lens. Uh, so, you know, had a serious conversation with her about, you know, your ocular surface is such a factor in how you're seeing. Um, it's not just the cataracts. So, you know, number one, you're not even going to be allowed to have a premium lens until we get this straightened out and see if we can get you controlled and compliant. Um, and if we didn't do that, you know, it, it would just be a, a horrible situation for you. You're not going to be happy with the outcome. So, you know, she decides, uh, you know, she's going to take this serious this time and, and wants to take every opportunity she can to get a premium lens. So if you yeah. go to the next slide, we, yeah, we see some of her parameters. Go ahead, Mitch. No, 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 go ahead. Show the data. This is really, this is, this is the nightmare. Yeah. 
yeah, so here's her staining, you know, she's just a mess. And, um, you know, she's hyperosmolar, she's positive on the MMP9, like it's bleeding, you know, pink, you know, she fills out her questionnaire, she's definitely, you know, moderate to severe dry eye, you know, but according to her, this is not a chronic condition, this is not a big deal. And, you know, the cataract is the only problem. So if you go to the next slide, um, now we're looking at her like placido disc imaging, looking at her, you know, topographic measurements. And, and you can see on her right eye, you know, how much that is affecting her vision, the curvature of the cornea. It looks like she's got like grease on her eye. You know, so I get this picture out and show her this. Like, you know, this is, this is the front lens of your eye. You know, it doesn't matter how good of a lens Dr. Jackson puts on the inside of your eye, this lens is going to skew everything everything, you know, the, the corneal surface. Um, so not only do we need to treat this, we need to, this need, this is a chronic condition. You have to take it seriously. You know, we, we start a, you know, significant management plan and, and then you got to do it afterwards as well. I love showing patients on uh, this OPD3, their keratometry mires, the round circles. It's really easy to convince patients something's wrong besides Osmolary numbers, my bombing line imaging, you can show them just the Myers. And they'll see like, without those being pristine, nice round circles, whatever we do inside the eyes would be not gonna help you see better. Mitch, what's your first reaction when you see this print out from the OPD3 in terms of cataract surgery planning? I know um. that the first reaction <laughs> is not excitement, but well, tell me what, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see this OPD3 on patient one? Uh, probably retire. Um, <laughs> He'd refer that to me. <laughs> I'll, say, I'll, I'll say Dr. Bollinger will be seeing you for the next six weeks. Um, but but uh, honestly, obviously, we're not operating on this patient right away. Um, and we're going to have a nice education discussion with the patient. And I'll tell them, you know, they'll wonder, like, well, all of a sudden, I go, no, you, you know, you. There's risk factors too. Remember, this is a patient with autoimmune disease and high blood pressure medications. Things are just going to continually be a chronic problem. We're not going to be able to fix everything perfectly, but we do want to optimize the ocular surface and we're going to take our time and do the best we can to get the best outcome. And, we, and I also, we have to tell the patient, once we fix the cataract, this is still going to be ongoing and you're going to have fluctuation in vision and we're going to have to continue to treat. So education is key. So, so yeah, let well, I me mean, go ahead. You want to start? Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, with this patient, you have to be pretty aggressive. You know, I, I have a lot of optometrists ask, okay, so if you're going to treat the eye, uh, the dry eye, how how long do you treat it? You know, before they're ready for surgery, and a lot of that has to do with how severe the situation is. So our train wreck patient, I'm going to basically hit her, you know, with everything in in the kitchen, you know, but the kitchen sink. So you know, her immunomodulator, which she has, you know, she most certainly needs to start using um, uh, twice a day. Um, you know, with her high osmolarity, uh, she needs you know definitely some topical steroids. So we started her QID. Uh, heavy pre uh, preservative-free artificial tears, you know, uh, throughout the day, every couple hours. And we did a thermal pulsation treatment in office due to her uh, meibomian gland issues. So somebody like this, you know, that's like your ultimate, hit them with, you know, everything you got. Um, and, and typically I'm going to give that patient at least three or four weeks, you know, maybe even up to six weeks, like Mitch was saying, because, you know, we have, we're starting from such a extreme level um, and then, you know, bring her back, see how, you know, how compliant she's been, how she's doing, you know, if, if she's looking better, but it's still an irregular surface, um, you know, especially if they want a premium lens, you know, I'd continue the treatment a little bit longer, maybe have them come back a couple weeks later. Um, and if we can get her, you know, normalized and compliant, um, then, you know, options will open up for her as far as uh, IOL options. One thing we're doing with one of our, we're doing a little test run here with one of our premium packages we're actually automatically including one of these thermal pulsation treatments as part of their package so they're getting it no matter what just to kind of try to enhance their uh outcome post-operatively so we're just making it part of the package it seems like it's helping because it's kind of people are spending money and this is part of the package so you might consider adding uh, a thermal treatment or whatever treatment device you have in your office as part of a premium IOL package. So this is the tell it like it is track. And I know we've gone over a pretty aggressive regimen. 
and you can offer maybe some ranges of things that you offer, but maybe a little bit more specifics as to what immunomodulator, what steroid, what thermal pulsation, what's the timing of that? Do you start the, the topical medications, bring them back for thermal pulsation? Do you do thermal pulsation first? You know, how does that look in a patient like this? So I think, um, you know, the key things um, in a patient, any dry eye patient, but especially this one, is trying to get the um, obstruction uh, straightened out and deal with the inflammation. So I, I would do the pul thermal pulsation immediately, day in office, if we can get the patient to do it, and uh, start topical steroids immediately. Uh, so the idea would be to, you know, hit heavy on the steroid right there, you know, taper that off, uh, starting the immunomodulator right with it, in, in my opinion, and then as you're coming off the steroid, keeping them on the immunomodulator. Yeah, the, the we like to do thermal pulsation day of, um, so people buy in and believe there's a problem. And by having the imaging, you can show them why it's so critical. But the key, I always, you know, there's all these complex algorithms, and we're talking about real life. The way Dr. Bull and I have kind of simplified it is we treat meibomian gland obstruction and we treat inflammation. And if you treat those two things, keep it very simple, you can get patients optimized very quickly. And so focus on those two items and don't worry about the complex algorithms, like how am I gonna do what I do next? What's the next step? Just treat inflammation however you have to. As you know, most Im immunomodulators don't kick in day of treatment, so you're gonna have to add a steroid like Isuvis. I, I said that one because that's one's, that one is approved, for dry flares, it actually has a label. So that might help for patients to get their coverage on that drop, at least here in the US, to, to start. Um, and then you have a wide range of immune modulators out there. So um, just a lot of it depends on, you know, the insurance game, but you know, you can give samples. I'm not a big sample giver in dry eye because they'll try it for a day or two. And if it doesn't work, they'll say it doesn't work and they'll abandon it. If they have to actually buy the product and use it for the four to eight weeks, they're more likely to continue using it because they spent money and they're committed to themselves. So I always try and make sure they, you know, get the product, use it. And if we have to sample them later to keep them on it, maybe to help them out. But if you get them to really engage in their own care and care for their own eyes, they'll probably be more compliant. Yeah, so um, that was the message that came out of a session yesterday with Mark Blumenstein and Derek Cunningham is the MGD myth is sometimes we make this a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. Obviously, this patient has a lot going on and they've got autoimmune disease and multiple medications and chronic disease. But the, the message that came out of there was inflammation and obstruction. And if you're treating that, you're going to be able to manage the vast majority of your patients in any setting, whether it's preoperative or just your standard dry eye patient. So you bring this patient back and let's say they're super compliant and they started the medication and they got their prescriptions filled and uh, their insurance was playing along and everything goes very smoothly. And they said, yes, Dr. Bollinger, I've been using the drops every two hours, just like you said. And they did the thermal pulsation treatment uh, maybe that day or maybe, hey, I, got, I don't have time today. I'm going to come back later this week. And they get that done. Now it's three to four weeks coming in. Do you go through that whole process again? Do they get the OSDI? Do they get repeat measurements? Do they get osmolarity? How does that cadence look in your practice? Yeah, so basically what we would do, we would repeat the topography measurements, um, definitely uh, look at our OPD3 that, that with the placido imaging, that helps, you know, immensely to look, you know, before and after that image that we have where it literally looks like there's a smudge and, uh, you know, making sure that's clearing, um, looking at the consistency of our K readings, uh, you know, uh, on our IOL master, um, and uh, certainly repeating uh, staining uh, would be the, the key, those would be the three things that I would look at. Um, and see if it looks like they have a good ocular surface um, at this point to proceed with cataract surgery or not. And if not, you know, I would go another couple more weeks of the same treatment. So that three to four week follow-up interval until they're at a point where their ocular surface is stable enough for surgery? That's right. And we bring patients back for, uh, on a caddy they come back for a scheduling visit with our surgery coordinator. So they got to come back anyway. So we try and 
scheduled that visit the same day as our reassessment of the ocular service. And if things are good to go, then they can meet with our surgeon coordinator. So it saves them a trip and they just do it all in one day. So it kind of helps. So going back to that first visit where the patients had glare and night vision issues and known dry eye, but then has this expectation or goal to be glasses independent after surgery. How much of that do you discuss at that visit versus mm -hmm. this visit? Or do you even do you even broach that subject until they become a viable surgical candidate? Uh, I mean, we discuss it right in the beginning. I tell them what a cataract is, and I, and I always only offer them two options, basically what insurance pays for or whatever we think their best upgrade option if they qualify. But we tell them we're not even thinking about any of these options until we optimize the ocular surface. But we do tell them we set the expectations, but we also infuse the whole dry eye education about how it's going to influence their outcome. So we, I talk about everything in the lane right up front. Let them know if they need time to think if they want to spend the money anyway on an upgraded lens. So you want them to have time to go home, discuss with their family or loved ones about the cost for that. And in the meantime, we can start treating the dry eye. But in this case, a, a basic <laughs> surgery versus a premium, both of those are off the table, right? In terms of what she presented with, or if that patient wanted a basic option, would it be reasonable to proceed? Or are you going to still optimize that patient's surface? Ideally, I think it doesn't matter which lens it is. You, you, you still want to educate them. T to me, it'd be no different than anything else. If they had cataracts and glaucoma, they have cataracts and macular degeneration. It's still a chronic disease that's uh, affecting the quality of their vision. So I think you, you would initially try to treat it. And, and, and like Mitch said, when they come back for their uh, already scheduled uh, visit to set up their surgery, we would relook at it again. Um, if it was a standard lens patient, I, I think at that point, you probably would let them proceed with surgery, but you have educated, established on the front end that this dry eye is a factor in how they're seeing. And on the back end and the post-op, if they're complaining, you know, you got to revisit that. You know, we discussed this, you know, this is, you know, something that needs ongoing treatment uh, versus if it was a premium lens patient, um, you know, I think it's going to eliminate them from being a candidate if it's not improving. And the other thing is, you know, a lot of these patients can't see from their cataracts. So you got to get them functional. So you have to look at the severity of the cataract compared to the severity of the dry eye and kind of make a decision based on the sliding scale of getting patients back to being functional. And so as long as you keep them educated in the process, you can make a decision to do surgery at any time. You just have to let them know the realistic expectations of, you know, post-operatively what to expect. Makes sense. Any other take homes on that um, first patient as far as what you're looking to do? I mean, you hit it pretty hard and this patient improved, I assume. And then you have that conversation about what that um, potential best option is if they want to go the premium IOL route. Yeah, I mean, right. and like I said, you don't have to have every possible diagnostic tool. Just make the diagnosis and educate and treat and set expectations. Great. Let's look at patient two, which is maybe not your train wreck patient. This is the patient you're seeing for the first time an outside referral. Let's uh, go through how that maybe is a little bit different scenario for what happens in terms of their perioperative dry eye care. This is, this is the patient that's actually worse <laughs> because they really don't have much. It's kind of like, I call it the silent killer of dry eye. Um, I've never had dry eye, doc, you know, and, uh, and they might not have been, maybe it's, it's easy for a referring doc to miss this because they're not symptomatic. They might have this cataract now, in this case, 68 year old male, you know, afraid to drive at night, flare and can't read fine print well. And it's funny how they say vision is better some days than others. That's already a hint. Fluctuating vision. Cataract usually like it's staying poor all the time. Fluctuating vision suggests something else such as ocular surface. They don't use eye drops. So they don't think they have dry eyes. They've never had to use eye drops. They are diabetic on high blood pressure medications, both risk factors for ocular surface issues. And they definitely qualify, you know, based on their cataract, they're they're bad or OSI scores, objective 
cataract next to look on our practice are poor and meet the criteria for cataract surgery. The tear breakup time, here's when you look, when you actually look at their asymptomatic, other than the vision fluctuation, a two second tear breakup time. They have really bad blepharitis. We'll show you pictures, my booming land disease, but normal osmolarity and you know, mild dry signs uh, other than the poor tear breakup time. And so this person of course wants to be free of glasses and feel safe driving at night, but they never ever thought they had dry eye, which is the challenge. Um, I guess we'll go to the next slide. So as you see here, their osmolarity is essentially normal. Even the inter-eye difference is less than eight. Um, which, because if that's greater than eight, sometimes that will be a, a hint that there could be a tear film homeostasis issue. But, and their MMP9 is negative, their OSDI score isn't really that bad. But you look and their tear breakup time is horrible. Um, it's kind of hard to show that to patients. But, and you look at their myboming gland imaging, they have glands, so that's a good sign. But they have horrible blepharitis as you can see on the right lower picture. Um, and so these are all contributing factors uh, to their problem. And so we now have to kind of re-educate this patient and tell them they actually have some ocular surface issues that can impact their outcome at the time of cataract surgery. Next slide. And this is, this is great. So this is my favorite as I've been talking about, placido imaging. Because if you look at the topography images on the right, the first thing you're gonna think is like, this patient has keratoconus or form proof keratoconus or pseudo keratoconus or something. And like, I'm not gonna operate on this patient or something's wrong. Are we gonna cross link this patient? I mean, you're looking like something's wrong. Almost 90% of the time or greater, a bad topography is probably ocular surface disease related. Um, and so really look at their their anterior segment, placido imaging will tell you, you'll see the Myers are irregular, and then you can show the patient. This is, this is what I like to show the patient why we have to treat it. And this is objective data. So a lot of the other stuff was normal. This you can show the patient is abnormal, and then they're gonna believe you and say, this is why we can't do cataract surgery yet. Anything you wanna add, Dr. Bollinger, on this one? Yeah, and I, th I think, you're right, Mitch. I mean, to me, this is the scarier patient because this this is the guy that's going to be at the post-op saying, your surgeon created this dry eye. They've got the wrong lens in my eye. It's the wrong calculation. I got the guy next to me's lens, all, all kinds of crazy stuff. And, 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 you know, and it's hard to sometimes get them to understand. Now, remember, we talked about this beforehand. You know, you've got this dry eye. You, you, it's a chronic problem. It's not something that you can, you know, stop treating. It is, it is a factor in how you see. Now, this is probably the, this is the big one. If you just have placido imaging somehow and show the patient, and you'll see, I mean, it looks like keratoconus. I mean, it's a big fool. So make sure you're really at least trying to do this in the office if possible. Um, <laughs> before, uh, if because this was an outside referral. So if you even have any way of doing this ahead of time, this will be big. You'll catch so many of uh, the dry eye issues ahead of time, and you can even start the treatment. And then when they come in for their evaluation, they already started treatment, which will help optimize their outcome. Um, next slide. I'm gonna jump back to the last slide. Oh, we yeah, have sure. a question from our audience. Steven is wondering on that lower right slide, is, are you diagnosing Demodex blepharitis in this case? I mean, you're diagnosing blepharitis, whether it's Demodex or not, you're going to treat it as if it is. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of different treatments for our blepharitis patients. So we're going to start the treatment regardless. It'll be nice once we have our approval for the actual Demodex that Tarsus has in study right now. So let's look at the treatment plan for this patient that's pretty much asymptomatic, although we had a good history and found some clues that maybe there's some issues. And then obviously we did our objective testing. In this case, it was mostly our tear breakup time and lid evaluation. So uh, Melissa, tell us what is a typical treatment plan at Jackson Eye for a patient like this? Yeah, so again, with a, a cataract patient, you know, you're wanting to go more aggressive and, and try to get a quicker reaction. So 
um, bluff X would be, you know, the first thought I would have for this patient to try to clear up that, you know, ocular surface because, you know, he doesn't see this. He, he's not used to touching his eyes. He's never used drops. Um, you know, scrubs are going to, you know, take a while to uh, get a response. So I, I would love to like get him right there when he's in the office and clean that up for him and then certainly have him continue to try to maintain it with scrubs. But I think you're going to get the biggest, you know, bang and, and turn around if you did the bluff right in the office. Um, the oil-based tears, I think, are critical in this case just because he does have a, a quick tear breakup time. And we all know how much that's going to affect his vision. Afterwards, postoperatively, he'll be sitting there, you know, Every time he blinks, his vision changes. He'll be telling you when he fixates on things he can't see clearly. So I think adding that oil-based here would be really critical in this case. Um, and, and this patient, you know, you could bring them back quicker. You know, if he did agree to the bluff uh, right there in office, I, I think within two to three weeks, you could probably bring him back a little sooner than he did that last patient to see where things are at. Yeah, it's nice. We like doing treatment in office right away, whether... Like in the last patient, it's a thermal pulsation treatment. Here we're doing a bluff X treatment. This shows us that we're actually being pretty aggressive to get them optimized as fast as possible. And you can include this as part of your premium packages if it's a premium option, but or just keep it a la carte. Um, and but I think if you start the process, they're gonna and and you show them all the things we've been talking about. They'll believe you more and they'll allow for these treatments to happen and then you're going to care about getting their eyes fixed sooner how than things later. Have, you, have evolved at Jackson Eye if you're packaging this with a advanced technology IOL is that mostly for the presbyopia correcting or light adjustable or will you do that for a toric as well right now we're we're, we're doing a test run we've been doing it just with the light adjustable lens um, package but it's something to consider for all our presbyopia correcting eye wells start packaging it because patients will feel like they're getting a little more for their money they're spending. And indirectly, we're going to be helping their outcome no matter what by doing this. And then what if this patient is somewhat hesitant to proceed knowing that they're pretty much asymptomatic and their optometrist that they saw in the community really has never diagnosed this, the patient's not aware of a problem, how hard is that conversion and education that first day is like, hey, we really need to do this for your eyelids to be able to have the, the best surgical outcome? What are some pearls in terms of how that conversation looks like? Or what happens if the patient says, no, I don't want to do that? Well, one, one thing I always say is we're a tertiary care center. And so we have a lot more devices, then maybe a refrain doc may only have one or two devices. We have all these uh, machines that go, you go through, and so we might have a better way to pick up something, especially when it's a milder form, um, to reassure them that your, your refrain doc did not miss anything. Um, and so if we're going to be doing surgery on you, we, we have all these technologies to make sure we don't miss something that's critical so we can treat it and get it optimized. And I think when it's a, a patient who's really interested in a premium lens and, and this is the stumbling block to you know, getting the okay to do it, it's probably a lot easier uh, to turn that patient to do a treatment in office. Uh, it, it, it is, uh, as, as you mentioned, Damon, much sometimes patients are very resistant to that, especially if this is the first time they're hearing about it. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it creates an awkward situation. I, I think, you know, being an optometrist in a surgery center now versus when I was in private practice is interesting to see this other side of this because I get it also as a private practice optometrist. You have a busy office and, you know, the patient's not complaining about dry eye and you're not necessarily going digging looking for that. And then they come to a center like ours where we're going to screen every patient for it and we're catching this. Uh, yeah, that can make the patient uh, think you're trying to upsell them or, you know, they're, they're hesitant. Um, so I think that the more we can work together, you know, with our referring doctors to at least stain the patient, you know, you know look, uh, look at the glands and start some kind of treatment or at least educate the patient that this will be a factor and something will be brought up at the surgery center, um, the better that whole thing's going to go. Is there ever a situation where you may refer that patient back to their primary care optometrist for treatments, or would that treatment almost always occur in your practice? I mean, we typically keep it in-house, and then we educate the patient, and we let our referring doctor know what we've already done, 
And so they're well aware what, what's been managed. And so they're aware of what they need to keep managing post-operatively too when they refer back after surgery. Okay. Any other pearls or takeaways from this particular patient type, the asymptomatic patient that wants it all, that isn't aware <laughs> that they have a problem that's going to maybe limit their surgical outcome? Um, I think just these are the ones you really have to show them preoperatively that the dry eye exists because like I said, they're the silent killers with cataract surgery. They're going to blame the surgery for everything, you know, um, if you haven't done that. And uh, go ahead, Dr. Moyer. Yeah, I think it's also critical as, as you're managing this patient, the optometrist, it's going to go back to them that they're continuing to emphasize the chronicity of dry eye and that uh, you have to keep treating this or, or you're going to start, you know, not seeing good quality with the imaging or your vision uh, fluctuating, that type of thing. So I think it's, you know, again, the team between the referring doctor and the surgery center to continue uh, educating and emphasizing that to the patient is critical. And then what happens after a successful surgery in terms of managing their ocular surface? We know that that first patient is going to need ongoing care. They're already in your practice. What does that education look like to the patient when they're ready to be released back uh, for possible co-management or a continued care with their uh, primary care optometrist? How, how does that conversation look in a patient that also has uh, dry eye disease and blepharitis along with their recent uh, surgery? Well, we're, we're going to, we're going to, they're going to be on a regimen already and we're going to uh, keep in communication with the referring doctor so they know what that regimen is. And so depending on the severity, um, when they're going to follow up for their regular post-op cataract check, but we'll kind of set the expectation with the patient on what the dry eye management process is going to be and that the referring doc will continue. And then if they don't provide, let's say they need an annual thermal pulsation treatment and the referring doc doesn't do it in their office, they can send them back and we'll be happy to do that treatment. If they do it in their office, then they can do it right in the office for them in the future. So take home points from this session in trying to uh, improve uh, dry eye disease uh, surgical outcome patients and patients that have cataract or needing to practice surgery, but also have dry eye disease. I think yeah. it's just like we've been saying yeah. at, the, at that at initial consult, you know, you've got to educate the patient on every condition that they have and, and uh, dry eye, you know, is a big one and how much that is affecting quality of vision. Um, and they have, just have to understand that, you know, there's not just something uh, like you came in with an infection and we treated you with an antibiotic and it's done. This is something that is like high blood pressure. It's like your di diabetes. You, you wouldn't stop taking those medications. So dry eyes the same way. And, and the fact that if they don't, it's even though they may see 2020, uh, they're, they're going to feel like it's not sharp vision and, and be disappointed in the outcome. Yeah, the, the, the near vision is crazy. When you do these prima myelos for presbyopia, I find the biggest complaint is their near vision tasks when they have ocular surface disease. They might read J1, but they go, I can't read, doc. And, and I do it right in front of them. They read and they read fine, but we're testing them for like three seconds. So they're going to sit and try and read a book or, you know, something on their uh, iPad or whatever it might be, or they're working on their computer all day, you know, longevity hours, they're sure breakup time and all that's horrible. And so you have to kind of tell them the expectation. First of all, their life activities alone can make the problem worse. Even if we manage it, it's still going to be a problem at times. You know, like we always say, if you're on a computer all day, you take those 20, 20 breaks and all the other expectations we like to tell patients. Um, but you tell them, not only do they have dry eye, you have to treat the dry eye. We have to educate them that it can change despite the treatment because they're going to say the treatment doesn't work. You know, li come, come live in the Midwest. It's 65 degrees to today, and in two days, it's going to snow. That's like havoc. And if you're wearing a mask still, well, hopefully we don't wear them anymore. I mean, it just ended. But all these other conditions added on top it just makes it a lot worse or better depending where they're at. So there's a lot, there's a lot of 
ex extraneous criteria as well as intrinsic criteria for the patient alone that can decide their outcome. So just got to set the expectations always with them and tell them, just tell them, don't worry. We got it under control. We're treating it. It's going to be lifelong like diabetes. And uh, our goal is just to get them as happy as possible. I'm always yeah, talking to people uh, about questions here. Uh, if you want to comment, we've got uh, just a couple minutes left in the session. Um, John asks, are there any treatments that you would specifically avoid prior to cataract surgery? Any specific dry eye treatments we would avoid? Correct. I mean, not that I, I mean, you could do any, we don't do IPL in our practice, but you could do IPL, you could do any of the thermal pulsation treatments, Blefex. Um, I mean, there's really no reason why we can't treat all these ahead of time. And then Jessica had a question about uh, blood exfoliation or Blefex in your practice. Is that something that insurance covers or is that an out-of-pocket cost for patients? It's out-of-pocket. Yeah. And you can have the, we, we've trained our technicians. Uh, we have certain technicians that are trained and certified to do some of these treatments too. So it doesn't always have to be the doctor. Right. Well, we need to wrap up here. A great session, Dr. Bollinger, Dr. Jackson. I really appreciate it being able to improve outcomes in our surgery practices in patients with dry eye disease. I am going to announce one of our raffle codes. There's these bonus raffle codes that are going to be all throughout the show. Uh, the raffle code for this session is Collarette. Collarette is C-O-L-L-A-R-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Should have actually made Mitch spell that for us. Make sure you get that right. We saw those Collarettes <laughs> that patient earlier. Uh, go check out the exhibit hall, all the things that uh, they've been talking about you can go and we've got um, people ready to chat with you to be able to incorporate some of these things in your practice uh, really this is saturday day two of eyes on dry eye this is the day that you want to take action melissa mitch thank you so much and i look forward to seeing you at the next session thanks for having us thank awesome. you